Hello, hello, good morning, good day, good generic time of the day, whenever you're watching this YouTube video or listening to it in the background. Uh, my name is Nate, this is the Volunteer Tech Vlog on the Live Sound 101 YouTube channel. This is the channel where I uh, talk candidly about doing live sound and practical things and thought processes and mindsets and, and kind of how to approach things. And uh, the idea of this channel is to share my adventures in the church tech world, uh, share my adventures with live sound, uh, and hopefully train a person or two out there that uh, is maybe brand new. So live sound 101, this is entry level stuff. I try to talk in a relatable way that, uh, you know, most people could understand, even if they're not from the live sound pro audio world. Uh, and I record these in the let's drive format. So we're going to be driving in a minute. Uh, but you probably already know that if you've been watching these videos. Um, this is going to be an audio lesson. I'm going to talk about things to consider uh, when picking a new mixing console, a new desk, a new board, as they say, a new mixer. So uh, what are some things you need to think about? Because this question, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a couple different forums and groups, and it's like, at least once or twice a month, somebody says, hey, I'm getting a new board, um, thoughts. And they throw out like this model or that model. And um, I'm gonna tell you why I don't think that's such a great idea. I mean, it's great to get advice. It's great to get wise counsel. It's great to uh, you know ask people's opinions. But when you're just going out there on YouTube or on um, you know F Facebook group, for example, or Google Plus group, and you're saying, Hey, should I get the X32 or the Soundcraft Expression 3? Um, you're gonna get, you're just gonna get overwhelmed. That's the, I mean, you might get a few little nuggets of information that you didn't know, um, but yeah, I mean, you're just gonna get overwhelmed. And then, like, the solution that really works well for one person may not work well for you. So this is why we are gonna talk about uh, the importance of coming up with criteria and requirements what are you actually trying to do before you even think about brand names what is your board actually trying to accomplish what is the need what are the tasks that you absolutely have to do with this board and it's really important to spend some time thinking about thinking about that first before you look for brand names and make some models but with that let's drive i'm gonna be Backing up here, coast is clear as I drive to work today. Oh, you're gonna have some fun sunlight. It's gonna be some good lighting in this video. Uh, but like I said, I, I imagine people just kind of put this on in the background and listen to it more like a podcast. So the importance of requirements, this is huge. And this is what people don't understand when you just go out onto a Facebook group and you, you say, Hey, what are your thoughts on the X32? So the X32 was um, a board that Behringer uh, brought to market, and it was like, it, for the feature set, it was the absolute cheapest thing out there, and so it became very popular in churches uh, for its ability to be um, remote controlled from like an iPad, from an app, and um, it's 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 low price point. Um, it's third little 32 channel. 32 channel board I've actually never even been behind one but I've just heard about them so much and seen people comment about them so much um, but yeah so before you even consider that you really got to think like what are your main requirements so I'm gonna think through because uh, we're going through this process and I've been talking with Josh and we're going back and forth and we're trying to think about okay if we get a new board what board would be the best solution to meet our needs. And um, so I come from the commercial systems integration world, commercial AV world. So um, I am a lot more, because of my background and my training and what I do for work, I am a lot more concerned with uh, functionality and value uh, rather than brand name. So it's like, it's not like I have, oh man, I really like, I really like this brand name board. I'm going to, I'm going to go with that because you know, that's, that's a good brand name board. I mean, brand branding does come into play in terms of reliability 
and uh, stability and all that all that fun stuff right so based on, if you've been watching my chronicles here you know that I'm gonna kind of veer away from Behringer right that's not gonna be my first choice um, but I'm looking at I'm looking at cost I'm looking at what is the practical solution versus you know what is, what would be an awesome solution you know what would meet the need um, you know apart from any type of brand name or anything like that so it I feel like I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth here because brand name you can't help but bring that into the equation but what I'm trying to say is I'm not gonna overlook um, maybe a brand that doesn't have as strong of a you know association with it just because of the brand name for example you know for, for instance so um, the other thing with Behringer with the X32s uh, is I've heard a lot of people having problems with them and I've seen a lot of videos people take on their phone of the thing geeking out and kind of doing some funky stuff um, so the X32 I don't know that's not that's definitely not gonna be my first choice although it might provide good functionality but let me let me let me take my own advice even before we get to brand names and makes and models and all that we really got to think about the requirements so what do we need this board to do because they have boards that are geared towards recording boards that are geared towards live uh, PreSonus uh, it's historically been more geared towards recording studios, uh, but they just came out with their Studio Live 32, um, and they've kind of also had some bad reputation with some of their things, like their faders and stuff. Did some did some funky things in terms of not having motorized faders. I'll be very specific there. That was kind of uh, you could remote control it, but the faders weren't motorized, so it's a little bit wacky. Um, but back to the requirements, I keep on, see this is, and this is what happens, this is what happens, you just keep thinking through the solutions that are out there, because the marketing people are so good. Um, what are the requirements, so what do we need? We need 32, minimum of 32 channels, 40, 40 would be really nice, because then we could have all our patches from the overflow patched in at the same time too, we wouldn't have to like repatch things for a special event so 32 channels uh, requirement number one 32 channel 40 would be nice so like you know somewhere in that range we could we could get by with 32 if the solution was right but 40 channels would be awesome uh, we really want to have the ability to remote control the preamps and so what I mean by that is the preamp or the trim is like the, the very first gain stage when the, the, the signal comes into your board. Do you want to like have to walk down to an amp closet or over somewhere else to like adjust the, the mic pre uh, physically? Or would you like to have the ability to control that mic pre remotely so you can do Basically, you can be lazy. You, you can you can set all your gains from this from your seat at front of house, and you can um, do your sound checks and set levels uh, without having to walk over. And that's a workflow thing. And that's something that right now, I'll tell you what, most of the time those mic mic pre's just get left the same week in and week out. I'm I'm pretty good about going over there and, and tweaking them if they need to be tweaked, but. Um, you know, once they're kind of set and you kind of use the same patches for the same types of sources, like vocals tend to be in channels one, two, three, and four. Guitar tends to be in channel five or six. Bass tends to be in channel 20. Um, electric guitar, 19. So things like that, that just kind of get left from week to week. You know, you could have a different guitar player come in and he has a totally different setup and, and rig and he's not giving you the same levels, but that mic pre stays the same just because people aren't in the habit of getting up, walking over, tweaking it, making sure the level is set properly, you know, around negative 12, negative 14, somewhere in that range to, to leave, leave enough headroom, um, but also have, have good levels all downstream of the, uh, of the, the mic pre. Um, that's a big one. So I think those are the two requirements, like just thinking through this out loud um, when choosing a new board, personally this is and this isn't going to be for everyone this is just the way i think this is this is like me just kind of being very candid what i want might not be what necessarily works for you or you want but i definitely want between 32 and 40 channels 40 would be really nice um and remote controllable mic pre's 
Um, we'll have some halfway decent mic pre's too. You know, you don't really want the bottom of the barrel. Mic pre's are a very important part of the signal chain because that's that's what gets you up from mic level to line level. And um, if your mic pre's aren't dialed in right or something's wrong with them, there can be noise. Uh, so that's a problem. Phantom power. I mean, that's pretty much you know like power windows these days in cars. I mean, every every pretty much every board's gonna have phantom power. I mean, that's something you should definitely make sure about if, in case you want to use condenser microphones. Um, but uh, pretty much all the boards are gonna have phantom power supplies. Uh, one of the big things is remote control mixing. So being able to have an iPad or a laptop or something and pull up a graphic user interface roam around the facility and mix from different locations that right there um, after the first two requirements that is huge there's got to be some app and it's got to work really well so uh, a company that has a track record of not only offering remote control um, or a mixing board that doesn't just have like oh, yeah we do remote control too but like maybe a mixing board that like hey, we're like the cat's pajamas of remote mixing. You know what I mean? Like, that is really important to us. So I'm going to favor that over, you know, some other bell or whistle that's really cool because remote mixing, our, our front of house position is awful. I mean, it's, it's you can't hear anything in the room. I mean, you're, it's like you're mixing from a cave. So being able to mix remotely is really important. So it would be really nice to have an interface that was done very well. You know, it's not glitchy, not buggy, tried and true, tested solution that, you know, people can vouch for and, and there's there's good history of user experience. Um, so that'd be requirement number three. Let me just recap in my mind. First requirement um, was 32 to 40 channels. Second requirement um, was remote controlled mic pre's. Third requirement was really good, like mixing interface, like an app, like or maybe like a killer app for an iPad that that works really well. So those are three requirements that we need. Um, the next thing, and this this gets a little, this can get a little dicey with like input cards and output cards, is do we want to go digital snake? Do we want to utilize a digital snake? Because we already have a 32-channel analog snake installed. We've also got a ton of Cat5 patch cables that we pulled. So we can do either digital snake or analog. So that offers us some flexibility, right? We don't have to pick one or the other. Um, like, you know, the, the, the thing that we're going to run into is I think if we want to have remote-controlled preamps, we're going to have to use a digital snake. So that's gonna, we're gonna have to use an external stage box. So that's gonna be an added, an added thing. Uh, but we have that flexibility of ne not necessarily needing the remote stage box. So that's kind of like a flexibility issue. And you gotta think like what format, if we do go digital snake, what format would be best for us? Do we wanna do um, Maddie? Do we wanna do uh, Dante? Uh, do we wanna do, um, Let's see, what's the other one? There's a, there's a handful of um, AES, I think it's AES 67. Can't remember the number off the top of my head. But there's a number of um, digital audio protocols. And Dante's a popular one, and Maddie is popular. Um, and that, that really comes into play when you think about everything else downstream of your live setup is, like if you go Dante, and you get all your, all your input channels coming in, and then you do Dante. Now you can do some cool things with recording where you just take everything Dante to a recording device that's external. And you could do multi-track recording over Dante. Or there's a lot of possibilities out there. You could do um, you could get a board that has recording built into it. Um, I think that's one of the big benefits of the PreSonus Studio Live, is that that offers like kind of built-in multi-track recording, which is pretty slick. But then you have to ask yourself, do you really need that? How important is that? Um, so I think the next requirement, I'm a little bit, then this is where it gets a little gray, right? This is where, this is where you gotta kind of go down. This is, I think, I think in the requirement 
phase, this is where you kind of you kind of like get so far, and now you have to actually explore solutions that are out there to see what would specifically work for you. And this is where it gets very time consuming because you have to look at Yamaha. Okay, what do they offer? Okay, Soundcraft. Okay, what do they offer? And what's the price range? Uh, Behringer, if you want to do that, Tascam. Um, you know, those are that's the kind of price range we're looking at. Those are the types of boards we're looking at. We're not necessarily looking at like a Digico or you know anything anything a Midas or anything like that uh, because that's probably just not going to be in the price range. So you know, why bother? Um, so what else can I say about pick, picking consoles? What are some other good things to think about? Uh, that whether you want to go digital or analog, Snake was the last requirement you got to decide on. I think probably in-ear monitors, uh, probably a good healthy discussion should be had about in-ears uh, because you could go the Aviom route and kind of add on or you can have some sort of standalone, like X, you can, so you can have like a personal mixing system in addition to uh, your, your digital board. Or you could go with a digital board that maybe has some of that personal monitoring built into it. You know what I mean? Like if you use the Dante cards, now maybe you just have a Dante drop going everywhere and then you can, you can get an external mixing system or maybe there's a board that comes you know, packaged with a personal mixing system. Um, so these are all things you need to think about. Um, so I think, I think really the... Um, the sticky wickets, if you will, the uh, the places where you're going to get bogged down and, and trying to spec a new board uh, revolve around how you want to do in-ear monitors, how you want to do your, your snake, digital or analog, and how you want to um, do your recording. You know, those three things are very, like you, there could be a gamut of requirements that you need for your specific church. And this is, and this is like, those three things are probably some of the most important things from a workflow perspective that you need to hash out. And if you just go on Facebook and you're just like, hey, which board is better? It's like, well, what do you mean, which board? Which board in conjunction with which options is better for what you need? And it just, it, you know, you can get steered in the wrong direction. So, you know, and I'm not, you know, you can you can go on there and ask people their opinion because, I mean, maybe you're asking, hey, how do you, you know, what... The faders, how do they feel? Do they have a nice weight to them? Maybe that's the type of thing you're asking because that was one of the things I noticed about the Yamaha, the TF5. It seemed like the, the faders were very lightweight. And um, I, don't know, I felt like I wanted them to be a little bit heavier. Uh, so that's like something you could ask on there. But then again, everybody's got a different opinion about like how a fader should feel. So uh, anyway, this video is not meant to disparage anybody or I'm not trying to call anybody out I'm just saying I see this a lot on the Facebook groups where people are asking about mixing consoles and there's just there's so many things that come into play um, especially that revolve around workflow so it's it's going to be kind of tricky to get any valuable info from that but um, anyway those are my thoughts on pick, pick, picking a new mixer We've got our eye on the Soundcraft Performer. I think it's the SI4, which looks pretty pretty awesome. So I'm going to be exploring some of the some of the options there. Uh, but uh, that should do it. Let me know your thoughts. What are some other things we should think about when we're doing getting ready to spec a digital mixer? Um, yeah, what how do we how do you, how should you how should you handle that? Josh, if you're watching this still, love to know if you've thought that this through anymore or like some different things that you're thinking about. And um, that would be awesome. I got stuck behind somebody going really, really slow. I'm behind this really, 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 really slow vehicle. And so people passing me are doing. Yeah. Yeah, this this dump truck is doing like He's doing 40 miles an hour on the highway. That's dangerous. Oh boy. Oh well. Good thing I didn't get hit. See you guys in the next video.